Welcome, everyone. Um, for, I'm going, we're going to start by, first I'm going to introduce Professor Craig, and then I'm going to introduce Professor Ayala. William Lane Craig is a research professor of philosophy at Talbot School of Theology in La Mirada, California. He earned his doctorate in philosophy at the University of Birmingham, England, before taking a doctorate in theology from the Ludwig Maximilian University in Germany. Prior to his appointment at Talbot, he spent seven years at the Higher Institute of Philosophy of the Catholic University in Leuven, Belgium. His research interests include the interface of philosophy of religion and philosophy of space and time. He's authored or edited over 30 books, The Kalam Cosmological Argument, Theism, Atheism, and Big Bang Cosmology, Time and the Metaphysics of Relativity, and Einstein Relativity and Absolute Simultaneity, just to name a few. He's published over a hundred articles in professional journals such as the Journal of Philosophy, the British Journal for the Philosophy of Science, International Studies in the Philosophy of Science, and Astrophysics and Space Science. Uh, for more, you can see his website, reasonablefaith.org. Professor Ayala here. Uh, he's the university professor and Donald Brand Professor of Biological Sciences at the University of California at Irvine. In June 2002, President George W. Bush awarded him the National Medal of Science at the White House. In 2003, he was appointed University Professor, which is the highest title at the University of California. He's published more than 980 articles and is the author or editor of 34 books. The books include Darwin's Gift to Science and Religion, Darwin and Intelligent Design, Genetics and the Origin of Species, and studies in the philosophy of biology. He's a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the American Philosophical Society. And he's also been president and chairman of the board of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which is the largest all-purpose scientific organization in the world. Ayala has received the President's Award of the American Institute of Biological Sciences, the Scientific Freedom and Responsibility Award from the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the 150th Anniversary Leadership Medal from the American Association for Advancement of Science, the Medal of the College of France, the UCI Medal from the University of California, and the William Proctor Prize for Scientific Achievement from Sigma Chi. And to start, our opening presentation will be by Professor Ayala, who will be arguing that intelligent design is not viable. Thank you, Dr. Monton, for the kind introduction, and thank you, Matt Basemore, and all the wonderful students who helped you in this wonderful uh, Campus Crusade for Christ. I have had the pleasure of meeting a few throughout the day who have contributed to make my visit even more pleasant, and of course I have seeing the students who are making sure here that everything happens in order. Thank you also of the, to the other institutions of the Indiana University that may have contributed to this event. I have been here before at this university. It's always a great pleasure to come back. This is one of the great masterpieces of contemporary art, a painting by the great Spanish painter Pablo Picasso, known as the Guernica. Um, I think we would agree that this painting conveys a message, the brutality, the horrors of war, the humanity of humans to humans. This was after the Nazis had bombed the civilian population in Spain and have killed 25% of the inhabitants. So we would agree that it has been designed intentionally in the same way that we would agree that a watch has been designed to tell time and a car has been designed by transportation.
You can see there are the letters of the alphabet and the nine digits. These are butterfly wings. Now we could use these letters to write English text and the digits to make arithmetic calculations. But I think most of you would agree with me that they have not been designed for that purpose in the same way that we would not say that a mountain has been designed for a skiing, although we can use the mountain for a skiing, and we can use a river for navigation, but it has not been designed for that purpose. The point that we'll be making is the human eye shares something in common with the painting and the watch and the car and something in common with the butterfly wings and the mountain and the river. It shares in common with the first set in that if it were not because of the purpose it serves, the purpose of seeing, it will not have come to be. But it shares with the butterfly wings and the mountain and the river that it is the result of natural processes. It is not the result of an intentional design by an intelligent designer. And we owe this understanding of our organs that have functions that have been designed for a purpose, but they have not been designed by a designer to Darwin's discovery of natural selection. The Copernican Revolution, so-called, started with Nicolai's, Nicolai Copernicus, who in the year of 1543, the year of his death, published this book on the revolutions of celestial bodies, where he argues that the Earth is not the center of the universe, as it was generally accepted at the time, and as shown, for example, in this contemporary book, a German book, where we can see the Earth Terra. In Latin, all scientific books at that time and for the following two centuries were written in Latin. So we have the Earth and the Moon, and then you have here Mercury, Venus, and then the Sun going around, like the other planets around the Earth, then Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and the stellar constellations. In contrast, Copernicus argued that the center of the known universe was the Sun, Sol, then Mercury, Venus, the Earth with the Moon, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and the celestial stars. But to understand the meaning of the Copernican Revolution, one has to go one step farther and look into some of his successors, of which I have lighted here two, Galileo and Newton, who lived 100 years apart of each other, and Galileo 100 years approximately after Copernicus, and they jointly represent of the beginning of science in the modern sense of the word. The commitment to the notion that the material universe, the natural universe, consists of matter in motion governed by natural laws. Laws that can be discovered, that are simple, that are universal in the sense that they apply on earth as well as, well as in the heavens, and that they can, subject, can be subject to test by observation and experiment, like this law of force equal mass times acceleration, or the inverse square law of attraction, that the attraction between two bodies is proportional to the product of the masses but inversely related to the square of their distance. They have left out organisms. They had been left out of the scientific revolution for a very good reason. It had been argued by, argued by philosophers and theologians, even in classical Greece before the time of Christ and all through the centuries, that had been stated or was eventually stated better by William Paley than by anybody else ever of, of since. Uh, in this book, Natural Theology, which was part of the canon at Cambridge when, the chance, when Darwin was a student and therefore uh, he read and studied 
uh, William Paley with great appreciation. William Paley developed an extended argument which starts with the human eye, pointing out that the human eye consists of numerous parts. Uh, here we have the cornea, the iris, the lens, the nerve, uh, which sends the information from the retina to the brain, the retina, and many others. And he says that all these parts are precisely adjusted one to the other, in the same way as the parts of a watch are assigned and to fit one with the other, designed to fit one with the other, so that the watch can tell time. If we see a watch, we are looking for a watchmaker. When we see the eye, or when we see any other organ or limb of a human being, or of other animals and plants, and also when we look at the relations between the sexes, or the relations of one species with another, or animals with their environment, we see in every case complex design, multiple parts integrated in a precise way, and wherever there is design, he argues, there is designer, and the designer of the whole universe, of the whole universe of life, all animals and plants can only be God. Well, it was Darwin's genius to discover that one can have design without designer. And thereby he completed the Copernican revolution, the scientific revolution, because now he brought organisms within the realm of science, explanation by natural laws, natural laws that can be subject to uh, testing by observation and experiment. He uh, first formulated his explanation in The Origin of a Species, uh, published in 1859, where, where as, uh, when, as we were told by Matt Bazemore earlier, uh, we are celebrating the 150th anniversary this year. Uh, this book is dedicated to natural selection. It's the origin of a species by na means of natural selection. And of the 14 chapters, nine are dedicated to explain natural selection, and five are dedicated to evolution, to the evolution of organisms, the evidence for evolution, and how that evolution demonstrates natural selection. His purpose in this book is not evolution per se, it's natural selection. This is one of the places where he summarizes natural selection, and we'll return to this. For the time being, I want you to, uh, to pay attention only to a couple of sentences. If such do occur, that is, vari hereditary variations that uh, can give advantage to their carriers, can without that individuals having any advantage, however slight, over others could have the best chance of surviving and of procreating their kind. On the other hand, we may feel sure that any variation in the least degree injurious would be rigidly destroyed. This preservation of favorable variations and the rejection of injurious variations I call natural selection is one statement of many, because the theory of natural selection is developed, as I said, over nine of the 14 chapters. And ever after, in fact, since 1937 or 38, shortly after returning from a trip around the world of five years, where uh, Darwin had been in a, a ship of the British Navy, he referred to natural selection as my theory. Evolution was not his theory. Evolution was the support for his theory. Evolution was accepted by many biologists of his time. What was new was natural selection. And what was known about natural selection is that it was able to explain the diversity and the design of organisms as the result of natural processes, and therefore the Copernican revolution was completed. Everything in the natural world, in the world that we can experience with our senses now, fell within the realm of science. Now, this fairly simple, simple concept in principle 
um, has now developed enormously. Um, there is an enormous mathematical theory around it, developing hundreds of thousands of articles, and there are thousands and thousands and thousands of studies that have published, have been published in dozens and dozens of journals. Um, but the basic discovery is right here and stated by Darwin, and we owe it to Darwin. And there is no doubt that Darwin is one of the greatest scientists of all times, and those of us who study evolution, who have a, a proper prejudice and pride, we think that he was the greatest scientist of all times. Now, the evidence that he uses for evolution is of several kinds in these five chapters. There are two chapters dedicated to geology, two to biogeography, the geographic distribution of organisms, and one chapter to comparative anatomy. And I'm going to look at some of that evidence uh, very briefly now. The first from geology, a field that has come of age during the second half of the 19th century. A number of studies have come to show that when one sees a strata of this kind exposed either by erosion or as near Cincinnati, as I saw four or five days ago, by cutting through by roads, if when you have sediments of this kind, strata of this kind, represent sediments that have been accumulating over time, therefore when fossils are found, as they are found there in this, uh, around these roads in Cincinnati, the fossils which are in the lower layers lived earlier than the fossils that are found up. This is the Grand Canyon of the Colorado River, so that paleontologists or geologists working on organisms can construct evolutionary lines of descent, like this one of the horse started with a small horse about the size of a small dog who lived about 50 million years ago to the modern horse. And many things are changing, not only size, but the number of toes, and notice also the way in which we evolutionists mark the origin of new species and their extinction. When a species derives from another one, we represent it by a branch. We use the width of the branches to indicate the size of the population, how extensive the species are, is. And notice one thing which is universally true. The great majority of species become extinct. We come only to the two kinds of modern horses, while many, many other species existed in the past. Contemporaries of Darwin were asking, where are the intermediates? If organisms come about by evolution, more or less gradual evolution, where are the intermediates between large groups of organisms? Well, they were known during lifetime, but Darwin, I mean, at the time, stand corrected, at the time when Darwin published The Origin of a Species, but he was quite confident that they will be found, and indeed the following year, in 1860, this fossil was discovered, uh, which is called Archaeopteris, which has the skeleton very much of a reptile, of a small dinosaur, it's an animal the size of a crow, but has many features which are typical of birds, the head has wings, and others. Three years ago, this animal was discovered tectonic. It was being sought intentionally in sediments of 380 million years of age in northern Canada, in the Inuit territory, because these other two animals were known. This starts to show, show some signs of being an amphibian, but this is still by and large a fish. This is clearly an amphibian, and as I said, three years ago, tectonic was discovered, clearly intermediate. But what concerned mostly the contemporaries of Darwin and other people who asked the question where are the intermediates are the intermediates between the common ancestor of our closest relatives the chimpanzees and humans by the time Darwin died none of these intermediates was known 
seven years later, in 1889, the first one was discovered, something now called, the creature now known as Homo erectus. It was discovered by a Dutch physician uh, in Java, in what is today Java, and he called it Pithecanthropus erectus, Pithe and Anthropus monohuman erectus, had a small brain, but clearly this physician who knew anatomy was aware that this individual had to have walk in on, on two legs, that is, that had a, an erect gait. Since then, thousands of intermediates of these hominids, which are the intermediates between our, non uh, the, our ape ancestors and modern humans, thousands of these have been discovered. Literally, dozens of them are new ones are discovered every year. An important one that I am going to use to illustrate a principle is Australopithecus uh, afarensis, Lucy. The point that I want to make is, according to the theory of natural selection, evolution will, be, will not be something that happens gradually in all respects. This is the way his contemporary thought evolution happened. Darwin said, no, different parts will evolve at different times in response, to the, in response to the needs of the environment. And here you have a classic example. If you look at two of the major features that distinguish us from the apes, one is we have a larger brain, three to four times larger than that of a male chimpanzee and then the bipedal gait. And if we look at Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis, here is what was found 40 years ago, 40% of a the skeleton of an individual. But I want just to look at the hip bone, the pelvis. A good anatomist will have many other ways to find out that Lucy had bipedal gait. But if we look at the pelvis, I have a larger because Lucy could have been a three feet tall uh, young woman. Uh, I have enlarged in size to compare the shape with that of the mother human and with that of a gorilla. And it's clearly that Lucy could not walk the way a gorilla or a chimp walks, uh, walks, knuckle walking, resting on the knuckles because they the hip bone was not large enough, so he had to walk like that. But the brain will only come, become larger much later, starting about two million years ago. Darwin used also comparative anatomy, and here I'm using a simple example. The bones of a dog, a bird, a whale, and a human. The four limbs are made of the same bones, organized in the same way. And yet they are used for completely different purposes, for swimming, for flying, for running, and for handling objects or for writing. And the argument of Darwin was, um, how do we explain that similarity? An engineer does not design an airplane and a ship and a car with the same parts organized in the same way, but uses new materials uh, for each purpose. How do we explain this similarity, he says, from a common ancestor, which had already this structure in the foreign limbs, actually from Tiktaalik, although he didn't know about Tiktaalik. Well, the most convincing evidence uh, for evolution uh, comes from a science, scientific discipline, that didn't exist in Darwin's time, and not for a century since the origin of a species, molecular biology. Now, we know the genetic information and the evolutionary information is in, in case in the DNA, in the succession of these letters, and the human genome has three billion of these letters. They have evolutionary and genetic information. If we were to write all the letters of a human genome, we will need 500 volumes of the size of the Bible. That's how much info genetic information we have. And every little part of that information we can use to reconstruct evolutionary history. By the way, I carry my DNA on my necktie. I don't know if you can see it. This was done copying from a book of mine, <laughs> that model. Um, the first demonstration of this was done in 1967 with a very small molecule, because at the time we still could not handle full genomes, not even large 
genes as we do now, large proteins. This is a very small protein, and it was done by two scientists, the leader was uh, Professor Walter Fitch, who was at the time a very young scientist, now he's a senior professor in my department at the University of California in Irvine. Uh, but this was in 1967, and this is how molecular evolution uh, works, the st comparative study to find out the relationship between different organisms. Uh, here you have uh, humans, uh, monkeys, and horse, and here you have the sequence of amino acids as they go. So that you align them, and when you align them, you find they are mostly similar, but there is one difference only between humans and monkeys, and 11 of 12 between humans and horses. That's going to be so, time to wrap up. Sorry? Time to wrap up. Okay, I will finish in one minute or two. So here we have uh, the comparison uh, in a simple matrix. Now, they did a comparison between 22 organisms. You have this matrix. You fit this matrix into a computer, even the computer, the two basic laws of evolution, and the computer produced this. An evolution which was goes covers two billion years, one branch goes, goes to the yeast and fungi, another branch goes to insects, another branch to the vertebrates. Amazing, a little molecule. Now we can use thousands of genes to do this, and indeed we have reconstructed the whole evolution of all organisms in the world by these methods. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll have Professor Craig's opening presentation, arguing that intelligent design is viable. Thank you. Good evening. I'm delighted to be participating in this evening's debate, and I want to say what a privilege it is to be sharing the podium this evening with so eminent a scientist as Professor Ayala. Now, in any debate, it's critical that we begin by clearly defining our terms. And this is especially important with respect to tonight's topic because there is such widespread misunderstanding of what intelligent design theory is. Taken in its broadest sense, ID is the study of justifiable design inferences. That is to say, it seeks to answer the question, when are we justified in inferring that design is the best explanation of some phenomenon? ID theory is applicable in a broad variety of fields, for example, cryptography, forensic science, intellectual property protection, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and so forth. independently given pattern. Dembski and other ID theorists have made the controversial claim that a design inference is warranted in the field of biology. For biological organisms exhibit just that combination of high improbability and an independently given pattern that justifies an inference to intelligent design. Now this claim has drawn down upon ID theorists the wrath of the scientific establishment. Some, like Richard Dawkins, reject intelligent design out of anti-metaphysical or rather anti-religious motives. Significantly, however, this is not the source of Professor Ayala's disagreement with ID. 
For Professor Ayala is, like me, a confessing Christian who believes that there is an intelligent creator and designer of the world who has revealed himself in Jesus Christ. Accordingly, Professor Ayala believes that the world is indeed the product of intelligent design. Now, I realize this may be disappointing to those of you who are Richard Dawkins fans, but this is not a debate tonight between atheism and theism. Rather, the question is the detectability of intelligent design. ID theorists believe that intelligent design is detectable in biological organisms. Professor Ayala thinks it's not. On his view, God has, so to speak, so carefully covered his tracks by using random mutation and natural selection to create biological complexity that no inference to intelligent design is justified. Now, I have to admit that I don't know if a design inference in the field of biology is justified. But what I do know is that the typical arguments against intelligent design are either at best inconclusive or at worst fallacious. And that's what I hope to show tonight. Now in order to show that ID is not viable in the field of biology, Professor Ayala must do one of two things. Either one, challenge Dembski's criteria to a justifiable design inference, or else two, show that biological organisms do not meet those criteria. Dr. Ayala takes the second route. He claims that the evolution of complex life forms is not, in fact, unacceptably improbable given the mechanisms of random mutation and natural selection, and therefore no inference to design is justified. This serves to focus the debate exactly where the disagreement between ID theorists and Professor Ayala lies. In his book, Darwin's Gift to Science and Religion, Professor Ayala distinguishes three distinct aspects of the contemporary evolutionary paradigm. The first is what he calls evolution. Professor Ayala defines evolution as the process of change and diversification of living things over time. In other words, organisms other than the first are descended from earlier organisms with modifications. Second is what he calls evolutionary history. This is the reconstruction of the universal tree of life, showing how the various lineages branched off from one another. Notice that this second claim presupposes the thesis of common ancestry, the thesis that all organisms are descended from a single primordial ancestor rather than from a multiplicity of ancestors. Now, it's interesting that according to Professor Ayala, neither evolution nor evolutionary history or common ancestry represents Darwin's unique contribution to evolutionary theory. Contrary to popular impression, evolutionary theories of life were common prior to Darwin. Rather, Darwin's contribution lay in point three. The mechanism behind evolutionary change is natural selection operating on random variations in living things. It is this mechanism which Darwin used to explain the adaptedness of organisms to their environment without the necessity of a designing intelligence. Accordingly, we can call this third point Darwinism. Now this makes it clear just where ID theorists and Professor Ayala part company. It is not on evolution or even common ancestry, but on Darwinism. In fact, prominent ID theorists like geneticist Michael Denton and biochemist Michael Behe espouse the same view of evolutionary history as Professor Ayala. They agree that all life is descended from a common primordial ancestor. What they deny is that the mechanisms of random variation and natural selection are adequate to explain this evolution of biological complexity. In tonight's debate, therefore, I'm going to focus our attention on the mechanisms of random mutation and natural selection. 
I'm going to resist mightily the temptation to discuss the thesis of common ancestry and Professor Ayala's arguments for it. I'll leave those aside in order to focus on the Darwinian mechanisms. Given the centrality of Darwinism to the debate over intelligent design, one would expect Professor Ayala to marshal a powerful array of evidential arguments in support of the power of random mutation and natural selection to generate biological complexity. But did you notice that all of the arguments that he presented in his opening speech were not arguments in favor of Darwinism, but rather were arguments in favor of the thesis of common ancestry? It's the same in his books. I've searched Professor Ayala's writings looking for scientific evidence of the power of random mutation and natural selection to produce biological complexity and have come away almost empty-handed. For example, he appeals to the experience of breeders in producing new varieties of, say, roses or dogs. But such experience obviously does nothing to justify the extrapolation of these mechanisms to the production of macroevolutionary change. Indeed, quite the contrary, the experience of breeders tends to show the limits of these mechanisms. Professor Ayala also appeals to the old chestnut of the peppered moth experiments. But all that happened in that case was that the proportion of light-colored moths in the population decreased and the proportion of dark-colored moths increased. Light-colored moths never evolved into dark-colored moths. Taken as evidence of the power of natural selection and random mutation to produce macroevolutionary change, honestly, to call such evidence paltry would be to pay it an undue compliment. Finally, Professor Ayala appeals to the ability of organisms to develop resistance to drugs and poisons through random mutation and selection. He points out how an unacceptably improbable double mutation can occur one step at a time to produce cumulative change. He then extrapolates the process to explain macroevolutionary change. But of course the question is precisely, can the example be extrapolated in that way? In his most recent book, The Edge of Evolution, Michael Behe argues that the very evidence of organisms' development of drug resistance is a powerful indication of the limits of random mutation and natural selection to produce evolutionary change. For example, malaria and the human immune system have been waging war against each other for over 10,000 years. Since the advent of modern medicine, human beings have been developing anti-malarial drugs to destroy the bacterium. Unfortunately for us, the malarial population is huge. The average person infected with malaria has over one trillion malarial cells in his body. Therefore, malaria mutates extremely rapidly and so has been able to develop resistance to every drug we've hurled at it. Simple, single point mutations are enough to make malaria drug resistant. For example, a mutation in one amino acid at point 108 suffices to render malaria drug resistant to pyrimethamine. On the other side, there's enormous selective pressure for the human immune system to develop some sort of defense against malaria, but it hasn't done so. Instead, what's happened is that a mutation has occurred in the human respiratory system which makes some people immune to malaria, namely sickle cell hemoglobin. Unfortunately, the downside is that it also produces sickle cell anemia, which is eventually deadly. Now, here's where things get really interesting. Despite its incredible mutation rate, which has enabled malaria to overcome every drug we've thrown at it, malaria has never in all those thousands of years and trillions of mutations been able to overcome sickle hemoglobin. Molecular biology explains why. Resistance to a drug can result from a simple single point mutation. 
But overcoming sickle hemoglobin would require multiple simultaneous